Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Lecture Series. Sit back, get comfortable, and let's go see what they have for us today. Good morning, my name is Leanne and I'm the Lecture Coordinator for the Peninsula Seniors. Today we're joined by Peter Small, the Historical Impressionist. He's appeared at many libraries. He's very popular here with the seniors. And today he's going to be treating us to John Adams. great honor to be here to speak to all of you. For you know I am advanced in years. I think I may share something in common with many of you, for I'm already 90 years old. And, and do you realize next July 4th, 1826, will mark the 50th anniversary of the founding of our nation, a nation of which, of course, I had a ro major role in helping found. But I am very glad to have all of you here today. As you know, as I mentioned to you, I was, it will be by more than 90 years ago that I was born, just south of Boston in Quincy, Massachusetts. And as I grew into my adult years, I eventually became a, a lawyer, graduating from Harvard and began to practice law in what was then the colony of Massachusetts. It was also during that time I met a lovely young lady, a Abigail Smith, the daughter of a, of a minister with whom I eventually fell in love with and had the great honor and distinction of being married to her for 54 years. And during our marriage, even if we were separated by distance, whether I was in Philadelphia or in London or Paris or Amsterdam or even later in our capital of new capital of Washington, D.C. We always stayed in contact with each other through correspondence and always addressed each other as dearest friend. And she remained that until she passed away about eight years ago. She also bore our four children, or actually our five children, two of whom only have survived to today whom I will talk about shortly. We had a daughter, Suzanne, who died in childhood. Uh, our daughter, Abigail, Nabby, as we fondly called her, succumbed to breast cancer. And uh, Charles, who unfortunately succumbed to the ills of alcohol. The only, of, the only two of my children who are surviving are Thomas Boylston and, well, one, what, my oldest son and probably my most prominent son who I'm sure you all recognize and are familiar with, John Quincy Adams, who as of this date, 1826, is like his father, is now President of the United States. As well as having been a great diplomat, uh, you recall President Monroe's doctrine, the Monroe Doctrine. It was actually written by my son, who was then Secretary of State for our nation. But as I said, I raised my family here in Massachusetts, practiced law, and began my career here, my legal career and my political career. And after the French and Indian War, Great Britain needed to raise funds to pay for soldiers they needed to station here. How did they do that? By taxes. And who imposed these taxes? A parliament that sat thousands of miles away in London, England, a parliament which claimed to represent all Englishmen. Well, were we not Englishmen here in America? And did we not have the rights of Englishmen? Britain was imposing a Stamp Act, a, the Parliament, which none of us elected, that sat in London, imposed a Stamp Act upon the colonists. And we here in the colonies began to protest that act. Why, my good friend and great patriot, and a great patriot, James Otis, came up with this important slogan, no taxation without representation. The Sons of Liberty were formed here in Massachusetts, and we protested, vigorously protested, these unfair taxes, which in the case of the Stamp Act, the Parliament eventually repealed. But still, they began to violate our rights, even though we were Englishmen. And did we not have the rights of Englishmen? Of course we did. And we wanted to assert those rights. But I felt they should be done through legal means. Now, my cousin Sam, I'm sure you're familiar with my cousin Sam Adams. 
He was whipping up the public against what he felt were British injustices. And it came to a head in March of 1770 when he agitated a mob which surrounded a group of a, a garrison of British soldiers who came out to protect themselves and in the result, five civilians were killed. Now, of course, many of you remember that as the Boston Massacre. And many people were shocked and outraged at what the British soldiers did. But they were merely protecting themselves against a mob. And when they needed a, and they were charged with murder. They and their commander, Captain Preston. Well, they needed representation in court. And whom did they cho choose? The best lawyer they knew in Massachusetts, although a supporter of the Patriot cause. It was me. But I felt that there should be justice. After all, if we are to demand justice for the colonist, if we are to demand justice for the patriot, are we not to demand justice for the loyalist or for the Tory? Yes, I ably defended Captain Preston against the charges of murder. I knew it would not make me a popular figure in the colony of Massachusetts, but I felt that the principle of law had to be upheld. As I told the jury, yes, facts are strange things. And as a result of my defense of Captain Preston and his men, they were acquitted. But my stock among the, my fellow colonists also rose. They respected me and respected my dedication to the principle of law. And I still very, very strongly believed it and felt it. Even though the parliament began to impose what we would call the intolerable acts, trying to control our trade and commerce and enforcing taxes upon us, again by this parliament in Britain that claimed to represent all Englishmen, although none of us in the colonies elected anyone to represent or to speak for us there, it was obvious we were facing a showdown with Great Britain. And in April of 1775, the good people of Massachusetts stood up to protest these British actions. The king and parliament responded by force of arms. We had no other choice but to take up armed struggle against the British Empire. I was elected one of several delegates from Massachusetts to represent us at the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the spring of 1775. It was there we voted to raise a continental army to resist British aggression. And since the this conflict, this war had begun in the north. It was felt for the purposes of unity. We needed a commander-in-chief from the south and one who had military experience. I knew such a man, and I was to make that nom his nomination. It would be one of three important nominations that I would make in my lifetime. That nomination, of course, would be as George Washington of Virginia, as the commander-in-chief of our new Continental Army. But still, there were many of us who were still debating whether the course should be reconciliation with Britain or perhaps make the ultimate break and make and declare independence. We were debating it among ourselves in the Congress. They were debating it among themselves in the colonies, in their legislatures. Why, I recall a letter that I received from my dearest wife my dearest friend Abigail, that I'd like to share with you. She wrote this to me in the spring of 1776 when I was in Philadelphia. She wrote, I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire that you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation that your sex are naturally tyrannical is a, <laughs> is a truth so thoroughly established as to admit of no dispute. Do, 
does she not understand that we men are subject to the tyranny of the petticoat? <laughs> But by June, it was quite obvious there could be no reconciliation with Great Britain. And I'll never forget that day of June of 1776, when the delegate from Virginia, Richard Henry Lee, offered the following resolution, that these united colonies ought to declare themselves to be free and independent states. A committee was chosen to write such a declaration of independence. They included Roger Sherman of Connecticut, Robert Livingston of New York, um, Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, oh, I'm sure you all recognize him, my successor as president, friend, colleague, and ally in wartime. Unfortunately, we were to become, much later, peacetime rival and opponent in politics. But now we have become reconciled friend of letters. The two other members of that committee included one man who in 1776 was probably the most prominent, respected, and recognized American in the world. He was a printer, publisher, author, philosopher, scientist, inventor, statesman. I am sure you all recognize the name, Dr. Benjamin Franklin of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And finally, yours truly, John Adams of Massachusetts. But when it came to the task of writing such a declaration, it was quite obvious it was going to fall upon the shoulders of Dr. Franklin, Mr. Jefferson, and myself. And I, I recalled, I approached Dr. I, I, rec I recall we approached Dr. Franklin and felt that, well, that he should write this declaration. Uh, he declined because he was afraid he might insert a joke into the declaration. <laughs> and then I approached Mr. Jefferson and I told him that you must write this declaration for three reasons. Reason number one, you are a Massachusetts man. I that you, excuse me, that I am a Massachusetts man and that you are a Virginian and it should be a Virginian and a Southerner that should be at the head of this business. Reason number two, I am suspected, suspicious, obnoxious, and unpopular. <laughs> and you, Mr. Jefferson, certainly are not. And reason number three, that you can write ten times better than I can. So during the next three weeks of June and July of 1776, Mr. Jefferson spent that time writing and revising the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Ms. Dr. Franklin and I would occasionally come over and help assist him in that task. But my major task was to convince the delegates that this was the time to declare independence. Yes, this was, this was our right to do so. By declaring independence, we could then negotiate with foreign nations such as France or Spain and perhaps seek a treaty of alliance or assistance from them in our struggle with Great Britain. Yes, the time had come. We had now matured into fully adult independent states. But still there were the, some of those among the delegates who were hesitant, reluctant, who felt it was premature. I recall one was John Dickinson of Pennsylvania who had been one of the most outspoken in our struggle against Great Britain, but felt this was premature. We were facing the greatest military empire in the world. But still, I went and talked to every one of those delegates, convincing them that this was the time to declare independence. I remember I spoke on the floor of the Continental Congress, speaking for an hour. When the New Jersey delegation arrived, I stopped and I began all over again with my speech convincing them this was the time, independence now, independence forever. And eventually we swung the delegations in our favor. Mr. Dickinson absent himself from the vote. We swung Pennsylvania's vote for independence. Caesar Rodney rode through the night from Delaware, swinging Delaware's vote in favor of independence. And then that great day came where we voted for independence, a day that I knew would be remembered all throughout history, a date that I believe that we would remember, July 2nd of 1776. That was the day we voted for independence. I, I, I even wrote a letter to Abigail that day. I said to her, the second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable 
epoch in the history of America, I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illumination from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. But the problem was we had not decided or had adopted our Declaration of Independence. We would spend the next two days debating, arguing, and editing that important document while Mr. Jefferson just sat there in silence while his document was being argued and debated over, I stood there on the floor of the Congress defending what Mr. Jefferson had written. And finally, it was on July 4th of 1776 that we adopted the final draft of the Declaration of Independence. Now, what many of you don't know about the Declaration that I would like to show you it was printed first. Oh, I should explain that after we adopted the final draft of the Declaration of Independence, we sent it to John Dunlap. He was the official printer for the Continental Congress. He proceeded to print over 200 broadsides or copies of the Declaration that were immediately distributed among the 13 colonies by horseback, oxen cart, boat and boot. Now, mind you, only two names appeared on this, on this original copy. Mr. Hancock, the President of the Continental Congress, and uh, Charles Thompson, the Secretary of the Congress. Now, later in July, the Congress authorized Timothy Matlack, he was a clerk to Mr. Thompson, to write an, an official engrossed copy of the Declaration. Now, Mr. Uh, Matlock had a steady hand, pretty and true for an occasion of such import, to write this official copy. This official and engrossed copy was, and famous copy was written later in July of 1776. Then, then in early August, the delegates returned to sign the declaration. While the words were Mr. Jefferson's, the handwriting was not. Now we were an independent nation, free now to negotiate with other nations. Dr. Franklin was sent over to France to negotiate with that nation to gain their support against their traditional rival and enemy, Great Britain. The following year, I was sent to France to assist Dr. Franklin. My young son, John Quincy, just 11 years old at the time, accompanied me on that trip. And it was a perilous one, I recall once, why... We saw a British warship within sight of us. I even manned one of the cannons to be ready to face the possible battle, which fortunately never happened. I arrived in France to assist Dr. Franklin, and every morning I would get up very early, go to the French court, and do my work and duty to, to gain the support of the French court for American independence. But where was Dr. Franklin? He was sleeping late. Do you know why? He was up at night flirting with the ladies of the French court. <laughs> he claimed by gaining the support of the women that he would, they would influence their husbands to support our cause. Sometimes I feel it seems that Dr. Franklin took his electric rod, smote the earth, and outsprung General Washington. And thus forward, these two conducted all of the policy, legislation, negotiation, and war. <laughs> I know people will say I was jealous, and yes, I realized Dr. Franklin already had an international reputation, but I was there to work on the behalf of our nation, not to party into the wee hours of the night. But we did, but thanks to our efforts, we did get a no, we did sign a treaty of alliance with France and gain their military support in our struggle for independence, which was very critical. But I also played an important role. While Dr. Franklin may have gotten military support, through my negotiations with the government of the Netherlands, I saw to it that our new nation received the financial loans 
that were necessary to see that our nation was not born in bankruptcy. And when we finally won our independence, I was one of the signatories to the Treaty of Paris, which officially ended our war with Britain and formally recognized our independence. Now that we are an independent nation, I was, I was honored to be appointed and nominated as our first minister or diplomatic representative to Great Britain, where I ably represented our nation at the court of King George III. But we were not, as I said, although we were an independent nation, we were still having our own problems. We did have a new government under the Articles of Confederation, but it turned out to be a very weak and ineffective government. And when Shays' Rebellion broke out in Massachusetts in 1786, many of us realized, even though I was still in Europe at the time, many of us realized that we needed a new and a stronger form of government. Yes, we had grown up under a strong king in Parliament and wanted to avoid that, but, but by giving all power to the states, it had been ineffective. We needed to come up with a new plan of government. Well, in the summer of 1787, as you know, the, delegate, the Continental Congress met in Philadelphia to write a new federal constitution for the United States. And in doing so, they adopted many of my ideas. No, I was not there to write it, but I had written the constitution for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which called for a popularly elected legislature, a governor, and a separate independent judiciary, three separate independent branches of government which could balance off each other, the system of checks and balances which was eventually used and adopted in our federal constitution of 1787. Well, when this constitution was adopted, a chief executive had to be elected. The states, according to their congressional representation, chose electors to choose the new president. Now, when the electors met, they voted for two people. The first choice would, of course, be the choice for president, and the second and the runner-up would then become vice president. Well, of course, we all knew who the unanimous and first choice for president would be. It was obvious, General Washington. And I had the honor of coming, of coming in second in that vote to be elected vice president of the United States under our new Constitution. Now, as Vice President, I do have one duty, as the President of the Senate, and to vote in case of a tie vote, to break that vote. Well, as the President of the Senate, I'd wanted to address the Senate, but the Senators quickly put me in my place and shut me up. They didn't want to hear from his rotundity, the Vice President. And the problem was, was I a member of the executive branch as vice president, or was I a member of the Senate as the president of the Senate? I sometimes did not know, and as a result, I did not attend any cabinet meetings under President Washington's administration. I wanted to maintain that separation of powers. And yes, there were many times I voted to break a tie vote in favor of the administration. Sometimes as vice president, I felt that I was nothing, and yet I may be everything. And yet, as far as the office went, I sometimes felt as if my nation has imposed upon me the most insignificant office created by the minds of man or that his imagination has conceived. When President Washington declined to run for a second term in 1796, I stood as the candidate of, our, of the new political faction, the Federalist Party, as its candidate for president. And in that election, I was opposed by my old friend, Thomas Jefferson, who was the nominee of the Democratic-Republican faction. I narrowly defeated him in the Electoral College, and as a result, I was president and he was now vice president. And I'd hoped to continue the policies of President Washington. I even kept many of his same cabinet officers, which I later learned was a mistake because their loyalty was not to my administration. But we still had problems that began under President Washington's administration. Britain and France were now at war. And I wanted to see that our nation continue the policy set by President Washington that we remain neutral in foreign affairs. 
But France, which was in the midst of a revolution, yes, a revolution that I know was inspired by our revolution. They, as we have our Bill of Rights, they declared their rights of man. But their revolution was quickly seized by those radicals, those Jacobins, with their reign of terror. And they sent their agents to the United States, attempting to subvert our nation, enforcing us to support thou, their cause. I'd even sent three envoys to meet with the French foreign minister, Mr. Talleyrand. And what did he demand? He demanded bribes, or tribute as he would call it. As I told the Congress, not one cent for tribute, but millions for defense. Even during my earlier years in France, I never felt the French had our best interests at heart, but only their own. And unfortunately, as president, I was to prove that. Demanding bribes for our nation, giving in to them. They sent Citizen Genet to the United States to subvert and to commit sedition against our nation, forcing us to support these radical revolutionaries. I built up our navy, and yes, we were involved with an unofficial naval war with France from 1798 to 1800. But I also felt we had to stop French sedition and subversion in our nation. And I urged the Congress to pass a series of laws to restrict that. And many people, I know many, felt that they did violate our Bill of Rights, particularly the freedom of press and the freedom of expression. But we made sedition illegal against the United States. And yes, we did prosecute several newspaper editors as a result. But we did not want to descend into the chaos that they had in France. After all, did we not write in the Declaration of Independence that prudence dictates that when governments are changed for light and transient causes, that the people are made to suffer their evils? We did not want to have that happen here in the United States. Well, I did intend to run for a second term in 1800. And before the election was held, we actually signed a peace treaty with France, ending our unofficial war and creating a period of peace that has, of course, existed between our two nations since then. However, when word came from Paris that this treaty had been signed, the presidential electors had already been chosen, and I was defeated for re-election by Mr. Jefferson and Mr. Burr. But in those remaining months, we moved into our new capital of Washington, D.C., the new District of Columbia that had been, that had been we begun to build in 1793. And I would be the first president to live in our new national capital and to move into our new president's house, the new executive mansion. I recall I made a... a blessing upon this, writing to Abigail that hoping that all future inhabitants of this house will rule wisely in the best of our nation. But of course, it was a big drafty old home that we lived in those few months, why we had to build fires in every house, and Abigail used the East Room, home, where I believe later on they would house and um, many diplomatic and formal receptions as she hung the laundry there. But we did spend the final months of my presidency in the president's house or the executive mansion. Although I do understand, uh, just after our recent war with Great Britain, when British troops, as you know, actually invaded Washington, D.C., burnt the Capitol and the president's house, they had to repaint the president's house, and they've been painting it with the color white. And I understand they now refer to it unofficially as the White House. Well, I returned here to Massachusetts and have spent my days here corresponding with friends and one day through a mutual friend, Dr. Benjamin Rush, a great physician and great patriot, he reminded me that despite the differences I had with Mr. Jefferson in our later years, that earlier we had so much in common. We had helped found this nation and had worked and fought together to see this nation established. And so I began to write to Mr. Jefferson. And for the past eight years, or for more than that, we have reestablished and reconciled our friendship. Although we have not seen each other again, we have become friends of letters. And I am particularly anxious about our next 
Independence Day, July 4th, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the founding of our nation. And I do hope that Mr. Jefferson, who is already 83 and I'm already 90 years old, that both of us will be able to live to see the 50th anniversary of the founding of our nation. Because I know when that day arrives, I will be able to say with all confidence that Thomas Jefferson survives. So if you have any questions for me, John Adams, I will do my best to answer them. What were the reasons for the, uh, the breaking with Mr. Jefferson and me? Well, I, be I believed in what President Washington had established as president the idea of a strong federal government, that it was necessary to, pro we needed a strong national government in order to ensure the existence of our nation and the preservation of our liberties and independence. Mr. Jefferson felt that the power should be with the states as opposed to the federal government. He felt that the future of our foreign policy lie with France, which I certainly do not believe in. Now, it did not mean I had total unity with, within the Federalist ranks. For example, Mr. Alexander Hamilton, that bastard son of a Scottish peddler, <laughs> trying to undermine me at every opportunity he had while I was president, just for his own personal ambitions. Well, I'm quite satisfied with the document. He wanted to know, was there anything I'd like to have seen changed with our that with the federal constitution that was adopted in 1787. Well, as you know, it was a series of compromises. We had, of course, um, conflicts. How much power should be given to the national government? How much to the states? How much to each branch of government? Um, how much power to the large? How should the states be represented in Congress? Uh, the large states versus the small states. Even on the question of slavery, which we wrote into there to be put off until 1800, or uh, actually to 1808. Uh, actually, I believe that is an institution that, well, we've already abolished it in Massachusetts, and I believe it would be a good thing if it would be eventually abolished throughout our nation. Um, but quite in all, I was generally satisfied with it. After all, these ideas were not just, these ideas were based upon what we were practicing in the different states. We are already self-governing states with our own uh, elected legislatures, our own independent governors, and independent judiciaries. As I said, I had written the one from Massachusetts, and they adopted many of those ideas that were written in it. So I was quite satisfied with the final result. Yes, sir. The origin of the United States of America. Actually, we did not even adopt that term until we finally adopted the Declaration of Independence. Why, many of us didn't even think of ourselves as Americans. We thought of ourselves as being, well, Massachusetts, citizens of Massachusetts or South Carolinians or New Yorkers, Pennsylvanians or Marylanders. It was only when we finally wrote the Declaration of Independence we saw ourselves as independent states, but independent United States of, of course, the continent of North America. Well, we, of course, without the Dutch loans, we would have been born in bankruptcy. He wanted to know about more about our negotiations with the Dutch to gain their support. Well, of course, they were the center of international finance, very successful merchants and financiers. Without their money, without their loans, we would have been born in absolute bankruptcy. I mean, after all, we were printing continental dollars, which we printed so many, they, the term became not worth a continental. We needed some strong currency, hard currency, for the basis of, to, to begin our national government. I mean, after all, we had the states printing their own money. What sort of a formula is that for national unity? She wanted to know, what did Mrs. Adams think of our fail, you say, you say our failure to equalize women in the Declaration of Independence? Did we not say all men are equal? We are talking about all human beings. Men have their responsibilities and duties. Women have their responsibilities and duties. After all, why did I marry Abigail? Because she was a very knowledgeable, intelligent woman, well-read. It was a woman I could sit and speak with. I wanted, to talk, I wanted to marry a woman who could be my equal. And yes, women are now gaining more responsibilities. More of them are becoming educated. Perhaps one day they may own property. And who knows? Maybe even have the right to vote. 
we may see such a day in our nation where slavery is abolished and women have the right to vote. But certainly I will not see it in my lifetime. I do not remember the exact details of those loans, but we were able to guarantee that our nation would be able to function financially in the world. Who influenced Lafayette to come to our rescue? Well, Lafayette was, of course, quite impressed by our struggle against Great Britain. And remember, many of the ideas that, uh, that influenced us in, the, in writing the Declaration of Independence, Locke, Montesquieu, Rousseau, and others, not just were English writers, but French writers who spoke about the natural rights of man. And I'm sure Lafayette was quite influenced by that. And when he saw we were fighting for that, that obviously influenced him to come and help us in our struggle for independence. Yes, much of the loans for our independence came from Mr. Robert Morris and a, a person of the Hebrew faith I knew in Philadelphia, Mr. Hyam Solomon. Uh, he loaned much of his fortune to our cause and died in debt. And we are owed much to those people. I became very well acquainted with them in Philadelphia. They had a congregation, Mikveh Israel. And I recall one woman there, uh, um, Rebecca Gratz, who started what was a, a Sunday school to teach about the Hebrew faith. As you know, when I was at Harvard and we studied the classics, we studied them in their original language, in Greek, uh, Latin, and when it came to the Bible, in Hebrew. The three branches of government, the Treasury is not, a, is not the fourth branch, but it is part of the executive branch. Well, the Treasury, when the nation, well, when we began our new federal constitution, the president, President Washington, established several federal departments. The Department of State to handle relations with other nations, the Attorney General's Office to handle legal affairs, the Department of War to handle military affairs, and the Department of the Treasury to handle our financial affairs. And even though later on we became bitter political opponents, he picked a man who was quite knowledgeable in financial affairs and actually had some good ideas in the ideas of, of finance and commerce. I don't like mentioning his name, but Alexander Hamilton. He asked, did I live to see my son become president? And of course, I'm living now to see it. It is now 1826. And yes, he is now our president. Now, I know there was some dispute about his election. As you know, the Electoral College chooses the president. And in the recent election of 1824, none of the four candidates, General Jackson, uh, Secretary of State Adams, my son, uh, Mr. Clay and uh, Henry Clay and uh, William Crawford, none of them had a majority of the electoral vote. And according to the Constitution, the House of Representatives then had to choose with each state voting as a single vote. And Mr. Clay threw his support to my son, and as a result, uh, my son was elected president and Mr. Clay became Secretary of State. Now, I know the uh, supporters of General Jackson claimed a corrupt bargain, but in a parliamentary government such as Britain, they refer to that as a coalition government. My son was originally a Federalist, although he actually broke at times with the Federalists. He supported some of the policies of Mr. Jefferson, uh, particularly in relations with, um, he supported the Embargo Acts, which crippled the economy of New England in trying to keep us neutral in the French and British War. He supported Mr. Jefferson's purchase of Louisiana. And, but but Mr. my son has always put the interests of our nations first before that of any political faction or party as I try to do as president. Well, I hope we are still in existence, that our republic is stronger than ever, and that eventually we will grow and expand as a nation. We've already doubled our size with Louisiana, and there's some talk of even going all the way to the Pacific Ocean one day. And maybe we will see that in some time in the future, certainly not in my time. Are there any other questions for me? If there are not, I would like to mention that I will be appearing in your time, I believe in the 21st century, I will be appearing in Confounding Brothers where I will be reunited with my old colleagues, Dr. Benjamin Franklin and Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Now I've been instructed to take off my wig <laughs> and become Peter Small. So if there are any questions you have for Peter Small, I'll be happy to answer those. 
sometimes when I've done these questions and answers, even with adults, uh, they'll ask questions of me rather than of the character. And or they say, well, what do you think of people today? And it's like, well, that person can only answer in their time period. So, yes. Um, well, I will tell you. Uh, no, no, I, I think that's an excellent suggestion. I do, um, I think I now do, what, what do I do? I do Washington, Adams, Jefferson, uh, Franklin, Theodore Roosevelt, and Harry Truman. That's about, what, six presidents. Yeah. Yeah, I also do Golda Meir. Some of you have seen her, the Prime Minister of Israel. I even do Moses, as well as Thomas Edison. <laughs> oh, yes, I've got the beard and my Ten Commandment tablets. Um, but ever since I began doing this over 20 years ago, of the two modern presidents of our lifetime that I would have always been impressed with, although as a teenager, as a youngster, I didn't care for them as president. I was happy to see them go, were, yes, were Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon who are absolutely fascinating people. You, you know, whether we liked or hated what they did, and there was good and bad to both of them, both fascinating people and personalities. Of course, I would need a good, I'd also need a good makeup job to do either of those gentlemen. <laughs> oh. How did I get involved in doing this? Uh, over 25 years ago, back in the late 1980s, I decided to go into education and I wanted to become a U.S. history teacher. I was studying at the University of Maryland outside of Washington, D.C., and I was doing a student observation of a U.S. history class at uh, Eleanor Roosevelt High School in Greenbelt, Maryland. And the teacher asked me one day uh, if I wanted to do a lesson on the Great Depression. And I said, well, I'd like to try something different. I always had this in the back of my mind, was doing a one-person show of a particular historical figure, and I did Huey Long, <laughs> uh, who I have always found to be one of the most fascinating – I know some of you may disagree with me, but I found him to be one of the most fascinating political figures of the 20th century. Um, I, I've always been – my impression was of him was not as negative as other people, but I just found him fascinating. And so I did a rather, you know, I researched quotes of his, sang every man a king in front of the class, and I thought, hey, this was really nice. A month later, I did a version of Truman. And with each experience I had, whether it was student observation, substituting, teaching religious school, student teaching, and even actually teaching in an actual classroom, I developed these characters as part of the lessons. And... Um, over 20 years ago, uh, I, was not get, I did not get tenure in the school district that I was in, and I was hired by Knott's Berry Farms uh, Adventures in Education program. I was the presenter in the Edison workshop, which gave me an opportunity to learn about Thomas Edison. It also gave me a more flexible work schedule, and I began to contact schools and clubs and organizations, libraries, congregations, whatever, uh, senior centers, retirement homes, about my program. And I eventually was getting, and eventually I just was getting, you know, I advertised myself and began to go out and perform for these different audiences and began to develop the program that you now see today. Uh, John Adams was not originally on that list. I was asked to do that, not just what we do, as I mentioned, we do a regular play at the printing museum. Uh, we've done it, this will be our fifth year of doing it, but also uh, the, um, it was the Constitutional Forum in, um, Orange County asked me to do John Adams a number of years ago, and so I've been, been working on and developing John Adams since then. You're right. The question is, do I, when I do these programs, say for younger audiences, for school audiences, it's not. The, is it the same? No, it's not. I mean, obviously, some of these characters I would not do for a children's audience. I don't think I would do John Adams or say Franklin Roosevelt or Harry Truman. Or once in a while, it has happened. Um, but for example, when I do someone like George Washington, Thomas Edison, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, or even sometimes Thomas Jefferson, I, in, I make them very interactive. Like when I do Washington, uh, when you saw me here, you just saw me do a straight monologue. With the children, it's a little different. I'll ask questions like, well, what do you think I should do, or what do you think happened next? Uh, and then I would bring some of them up, and I would say, oh, I need some volunteers to help me. For example, in, when it comes to the French and Indian Wars, I need some volunteers to help fight for His Majesty the King. Do I have any? So I choose six children out of the audience, and we pretend I show how he gets ambushed in that war. Or I talk about, oh, um, I, we need to cross the Delaware River. I need six 
able-bodied people to help fight for independence and liberty. I choose them and then we pretend we row across the Delaware River, freeze at Valley Forge, you know, to get, make them part of the story. And that was one of the challenges I had to learn because when I first started doing it, these were originally monologues and when, especially with children, I noticed they weren't listening all the time. They were getting edgy. And one of the constructive criticisms was make it interactive. And I kept on thinking, how can I do it? And eventually I found ways of doing that. I do that with Theodore Roosevelt. I have them pretending, you know, I have a group of children pretend we march around and we pretend we charge up San Juan Hill or that we're out hiking with him as president or we're on a, uh, his... Um, what was nearly ill-fated voyage to the uh, a tributary of the Amazon in uh, later in his life, but things like that, I bring them into the story and make them part of the story. Yes, well, I think I've learned to make them all fun. Uh, of the ones that I enjoy the most, that I, it's very which I enjoy, I think I make them the most lively is Harry Truman. Um, I'm, you know, which is interesting, you know, when the man had to give a, like Lyndon Johnson, when the man had to give a prepared speech, he was dull. <laughs> it was pretty, you know, Franklin Roosevelt or John F. Kennedy could give a, you know, a prepared speech and it was wonderful. Barack Obama is the same way. But when Lyndon Johnson or Harry Truman had to give a prepared speech, it was, sorry, it was a b boring. But when they could get away from that and be themselves, these men were interesting. Uh, that's where you get the give him hell style that Truman used in his 48 campaign. They told him, be a little more off the cuff, be a little more spontaneous. I mean, he had notes in front of him, but he, you know, instead of following the exact text, got a little more loose. And Truman was an experienced campaigner. He knew how to, as he would say, demagogue it up. And he did. And, and I find, and I've always liked Truman ever since I was a child. He had to face a lot of important um, decisions as president. And a lot of the things that I saw coming about in the 1960s were things, were uh, policies that he were all, that had were advocating back in the late 1940s: civil rights, Medicare, among others. Okay, thank you all very much for having me back here. Thank you for watching Peninsula Senior Lecture Series. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.